Well, hello again, and welcome to the latest installment of Tiny Plane Enormous Runway. We're at the uh, Kennedy Space Center here at Cape Canaveral in Florida, and um, we're here for two reasons. Uh, one is to uh, test the hypothesis that uh, X-Plane 11's flight model is a little bit broken when it comes to the ground effect. In essence, people are reporting that um, the airplane tends to slam to the ground in the last 10 feet. Um, also, I've heard, alternatively, I've heard that um, this has been fixed um, in the run-up to um, 11.01 uh, or 2. Um, I've also heard that it hasn't been fixed and won't be till 11.1. .1. The way we're going to test it is the essence of simplicity itself as we just test our control surfaces here. What we're going to do, and this is why we want a long runway to do it, is we're going to set up an unbelievably shallow descent right up till we touch the ground and uh, thereby we're going to see what kind of um, effect the ground effect does or doesn't have. If the ground effect does have an effect and we're descending, say, at 20 feet per minute, the cushion of air underneath the airplane, which is the ground effect, um, and that's why low-wing planes are more effective than high-wing planes, um, will counteract our very, very tiny rate of descent and will float. And if it is non-existent, we'll continue to descend. And if it is for some odd reason negative, we will smack down on the ground as, as people have been seeing. Um, when you land a real plane, of which I've got limited experience, or if you're in a plane that is well landed, uh, either commercially or just sitting in a private plane, you'll notice that at the flare, um, and at the power rolling off in the flare, you get a sense like you're sliding into third base, like you are descending downward and plunging just ever so slightly because the power comes off. At the same time, you're being met by a cushion, a third base, of dirt that slows you down. In this case, is a cushion of air, which, of course, if you bring your angle of attack upwards, um, the vector of this wing is going to be as if it is sort of plowing into the thicker, denser air that's caused by um, the proximity of the surface to the ground. And as an end result, if you balance the power roll off and the flare and the descent just right, you will, in essence, be cushioned and, and, and gently touch the ground as your speed and therefore the pressure of the air underneath the wing and the lift over the wing uh, decay. That is the ideal. Uh, what I've noticed, uh, not so much in this plane, but uh, especially in the, uh, in the, in the beach uh, uh, barren with the reality expansion pack, is it tends to um, smack down in the last five or ten feet and the nose certainly comes down. Now I've got it set up with a fairly rearward C of G with a couple passengers and some cargo in here. So it might not behave so badly. Um, I might have chosen the wrong thing to test the hypothesis with, but what we're going to do, and this is the reason for the long runway, is we are going to um, take off and we're going to, in the, in the takeoff, figure out basically what our minimum power is to stay in the air We'll peg our descent to that, we'll trim ourselves out so that we're just above stalling and we're descending hardly at all. And that's why you have a long runway because you, um, on a very short runway, you're kind of plunging in or dragging it in and there's no room for any error. Um, this will give us a lot of space in case we float down the runway to just float down the runway. Uh, reason two for being here is we're going to build uh, an ortho XP scenery tile. Um, a bunch of viewers have requested it, and um, you know, ordinarily, um, you know, you you see ortho scenery in you know the mountains, and it looks great. Um, I'll just show you the benefit it can have here as we kind of look around here. And what is that thing belching smoke? Uh, that doesn't seem quite right. 
that's not a campfire. But on closer inspection, let's see what this is. It is a gasoline truck. Ah! Oh! That is the Lunar Module Simulator. Uh, known in its day as the Flying Bedstead, because obviously it looks like a bed frame. Uh, it'd be a pilot strapped in here, and basically what it was was a giant jet engine that would blow fast enough to simulate the one-sixth gravity of the moon by basically eliminating five-sixths of the gravity here on Earth, and then you would vary the strength of it to simulate a rocket motor on top of it, and there were little thrusters around it um, so that um, your uh, humble pilot could get to know how the LEM might behave. Um, what really happened was it almost killed a bunch of astronauts, including Neil Armstrong, and um, actually I think We've uh, got uh, some footage here of that, so let me just show you here. So that is this by the looks of it, and here we go. Creepy music. The Lunar Lander Research Vehicle, or LLRV, was basically a big jet engine that pointed straight down with a pilot seat bolted on the front. Dubbed the Flying Bedstead, the main engine eliminated most of the vehicle's weight, simulating the moon's gravity. Smaller side-mounted thrusters provided a pretty good imitation of the real lander's handling characteristics. You steered the vehicle by tilting it. Too little and you exhausted your fuel. Too much and you'd fall out of the sky. There was no room for error, mechanical or otherwise. Most of the Apollo lunar pilots had trained in the flying bedstead. The first one to land the real thing on the moon would be a matter of luck. Any of the crews could draw the assignment, depending on how the upcoming rehearsal flights turned out. One of NASA's most experienced pilots, Neil Armstrong, had had his share of hair-raising adventures in both the X-15 rocket plane and the Gemini spacecraft. With the LEM, however, he had to learn a whole new way to fly. Armstrong activated the trainer for another landing simulation. Equipped with just enough fuel for a six-minute flight, the trainer balanced on the thrust of its jet engine like a dinner plate on a broomstick. Each moment teetered on the brink of calamity. And then a thruster failed. Armstrong tried to compensate. See, this is the thruster right there that failed. Armstrong pulled the ejection ring at the last possible moment. Apart from a bloody tongue bitten on impact, he was unharmed and anxious to climb back on board. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about that part, but... Um in case you ever wondered why he was so preternaturally calm uh, with 30 seconds of fuel remaining on the moon trying to avoid a boulder field, um, that experience as much as any probably explains it. So uh, we have a far less onerous task about us today. Um, so let's get going with that, do a little experimentation. I'm just going to do a wide left hand pattern here. And what I'm going to do, because of all of our uh, runway here, is just roll up the power as slowly as you please. And we'll figure out what our uh, correct um, power settings should be for a very, very gentle descent. Right, here we go. We're up to about 14 inches. Manifold pressure. And the yoke is coming back. Okay. I'm not going to rotate over exuberantly here. I'm just going to gently let the airplane fly off. And it 
barely does. So we don't stall it. Let me just get a little more power on. So I'm basically riding up the runway right now. There we go. There's the stick shaker. All right, so that's about where we should be. We should be about 17 pounds of power, probably for a mild descent. I'm climbing at about 20 feet per minute here, so I'm going to just get to our standard climb power. Get our gear up. There we are. And you can see we've got about eight miles of runway remaining, but nonetheless. All right, so it'll be about 25, bring back down to 25 right there. And uh, bear in mind that's with no flap, so probably I need, well, I'm descending slightly. Yeah, I guess about 17 pounds of, uh, and a full pressure should do it. So there is the uh, vehicular assembly building right there, and there's the shuttle on its uh, ferry plane. And off in the distance, we're flying uh, to, uh, South here is uh, the D Launch Complex 39A or B. I forget which one they kept. They decommissioned one of them. Uh, they don't have it modeled here, but it's right off the end of this right here. All right, we'll just, instead of turning crosswind, we'll just. Um, Do a nice standard rate turn 180 degrees away. Ah, okay, there's one of the 239s, and there's the other one right there. Now level off here. Typical of the runway, we're a nice distance away. Just level out here. And we will wait for the entire length of this runway to come crawling by. Just going to slow down a bit because we really don't need the speed. Not flying a standard pattern anyway, but nonetheless. All right, there's not a ton of wind, so it's not going to affect us too materially. What I don't want is to introduce drag from a lot of, of rudder movement, or any movement, as a matter of fact, uh, to complicate the uh, equation. So, trim here, and bring our props up. This is highly unnecessary this far away, but let's just do it by the books, wait till we're over the numbers. speed, we're about 110. We're going to be aiming for about 70 with a very, very, very mild rate of descent. Right, we're more or less over the numbers, so bring the gear down. And again, we'll just do a 180 to our uh, runway heading. My apologies, I should have set up the uh, track IR. I have not. Put in one notch of flaps. And we're going to get configured early because the, the aim of this exercise is not to do it by the book. The aim of the exercise is to get into the unbelievably stable uh, final configuration in enough time so that we're not changing that variable as we are doing our experiment. All right, so there. and that gives us level flight with one stage of flaps. I really want to have two stages of flaps out, so let's just do that right now. Get fully configured. This will give us more lift, but also more drag. And we're just going to come around and turn to final. A little 
little slow. I'm keeping my alpha fairly low so that we don't stall just from the turn, which is certainly possible. Okay, so there's our runway. Shallow out the turn a little bit here. Keep it standard rate, which happens to be right on this index mark. See what our rate of descent is. It's nil. I'll just Alright, so there we are. My god, that's a lot of runway. Look at that. I guess it's not a lot of runway when your uh, uh, V app is, is 275 knots and you're coming down at a slope of about, oof, about 8 or 9 degrees. I guess it's not, but let's just trim out and get ourselves into just the world's shallowest descent. Actually, what I want to do first is get us a little bit lower here. I'll just bring in some speed, bring out, some, bring in some pitch, bring out some power. Let's get us here. All right, there we go. All right, so we'll bring the nose up here, bring the power to about... I'm just creeping up the power as the speed bleeds off, and I'm going to meet the speed with the power, as it were. All right, that should get us there. So we trim. All right, so we're at about a 25 foot per minute rate of descent. And I'm not going to flare on this. I'm just going to come down, and I'm, I'm not as stable as I'd like to be. So I'm just. And this is hence the long runway here. Up and bring the nose up and bring it up just a little more to right about there. We're barely descending. And I'm just going to note and see whether we sink in the last second. Uh, we do, just a little bit. Try that again. We trim. And this time, we do not. Try one more time here. Yeah. A little more power. I suspect the results here are going to be inconclusive. Could be down to technique. There, that's your full stall landing. I don't know. Hard to say. Um, I'd welcome your uh, your, uh, your input here. And in the meantime, let's uh, let's show you how to make a scenery tile for this area. Um, if you're unfamiliar, the program Ortho 4XP, which you can go to the uh, explain forums there's a specific forum for ortho 4xp and you can um, download the app um, in um, in windows it's an executable in the mac it's uh, it's a python script and you need to do a little more setup with the python interpreter 
But basically what it does is it takes this. Here, let's uh, find out where we're going. We're going to be at here, right here as a matter of fact. That's the Kennedy Landing Facility right there. And um, it takes this, these satellite pictures. Oh, we're going to be on the border between two. Well, we might be. It takes these pictures right here and drapes them over scenery. It builds masks for the water to uh, blend X-Plane's artificial water with photos of water and the shorelines and so on and so forth. You can tell that these are from different passes of the satellite because you can see right here this straight edge and um, We're going to build a scenery tile that not only puts the photos of the ground on uh, the scenery, but also allows us, allows X-Plane to overlay its own highways using open street map data and its own trees and other things like, uh, like that. And, uh, okay, those are our two launch complexes. There's A and there's B. And I, again, I forget which one is operational. And I think one of them is used by SpaceX now. Um, unbelievably cool. Um, let's see, where's pad 34? That's where the other Saturn stuff, there it is, 34 is where uh, uh, the Saturn 1B launches. And this is where um, the uh, Saturn 1 um, disaster happened. Um, otherwise, Gus Grissom might have been the first man to uh, set foot on the moon, um, assuming the hatch didn't just blow. Uh, all right, and so build that. I just keep an eye at this little button hook right here, the Canaveral bite. Um, and um, so what you do is you download your Ortho 4 XP, and uh, basically um, you get a directory of stuff like this um, and in the Windows version you get an executable and a shortcut to it the executable is in the binary uh, folder but it doesn't matter you'll you'll read the manual which is more than I did um, you start the sucker up and you are confronted with uh, this which looks pretty inscrutable um, it's basically the, the console where you do all your work. But then, what you used to have to do is you'd have to say, all right, what tile do I want to build? What are the coordinates of it? You'd have to go to a website to get that. What's the elevation data? You'd have to go to another website to get that. And on and on and on. Now what you do is, uh, first of all, this is um, a console here that you can see the... the, the um, the commands it uh, spits out, but we don't care. So what you do is you go to the Earth tile map and it pops up another uh, window that's a little more scrutable. And you notice all these little blue things. These are tiles I've built here and in the west and the Pacific Northwest. I've not done Florida yet. And so what we're going to do is we're going to find the tile that happens to correspond with that little bump right there, which is the uh, uh, Canaveral bite right there and unfortunately I have not figured out a way to get it to zoom in here so what you do now is you do that you double click on it gives you a latitude and longitude and it populates the latitude and longitude here uh, right down here you can choose where to build it if you don't choose where to build it it builds it within the ortho 4 XP hierarchy right here where it says tiles. And if you're running out of space and you want to build it elsewhere, you should. And you can specify it there. Base source, BI, that's Bing. Uh, for the United States, Bing is very good. Geo2 is good. Uh, Google can be good, but Google has watermarks on it. Base is zoom level. Uh, highest is 19. 
um, and that is the uh, most uh, uh, um, resolution. It's the, the lower you fly, the more resolution you would want. The problem is if you build an entire tile out of resolution 19, sumo level 19, um, you will burn your computer to the ground. So a good compromise is 17, and as I'll show you in a minute or two, then you can set a higher zoom level to within a certain radius around airports. So we'll choose 17. C source, C zoom level, don't worry about it. Uh, and the way I'm doing this is not, this is not a comprehensive lesson. This is a functional lesson on how to get rolling um, pretty simply. Um, so um, all these buttons here are for the building of things, and it's a little bit confusing because they have these steps, which you do follow, but really you need to set some other parameters first. Um, we definitely want to use complex masks, and we definitely want to use masks for inland, and the reason why is this. The masks determine the interface between water and uh, and uh, or pictures of water and X planes water and also the coastlines. If you do not use masks for inland, you will get this picture of the Indian River smacked into your scenery, which is fine, but it won't move. It won't do any of the things that X plane water does. If, on the other hand, you do choose masks for inland, you will get a blend between the two, depending on the proportions you set right here. And so we are going to choose masks for inland. Um, that way you don't end up with um, frozen pictures where you've got rivers and great lakes and things like that. Um, the ratio, the higher the number, the more of the photo water you get on there, and I'm going to change this to 0.5 just to see what it does. Um, and then down here is the other important thing. Choose where it gets its overlays from. If you do not, and it can't find it, it won't build overlays, and so the scenery you get will look just like this, but all the roads will be these roads, including these cars frozen in place here. You will not see an overlay, hence overlay, of X planes, roads, and traffic, and houses and trees. And some people like that. Some people don't mind, and it's much better for performance. But you give up some of the sort of um, plausible world stuff to do it. And so by choosing an overlay directory and telling it where to get its overlay information from, you can sort of have the best of both worlds. You can have photo scenery, um, especially when you're higher up, and as you get lower down, you'll see um, autogen buildings and cars and trees and things. So what you do is you click on that and you choose your global scenery folder, and then X-Plane 11 global scenery. You do not go any farther, and in you go. The only exception for this is when you're building tiles in the Seattle area, and I discovered this totally by accident. I built the tiles, and I chose this for the global scenery, uh, for the overlay, and it produced none of that. And I ran it again, and I watched the output right here, and it said uh, something along the lines of, there's no information in the directory you chose to sniff. What it was saying is there is no overlay for Seattle in this folder. However, there is overlay in demo areas. So when you're building it around Seattle, you have to choose this. Otherwise, um, you choose this for the whole rest of the world. And you do not go one level down. You choose so that it's that right there. Now. All you have to do is click Build Vector Data, wait for it to do that. Build Base Match, wait for it to do that. Build Masks, wait, and then build that. Um, what you'll not get is some of the fancier stuff around airports. So I want to show you how to do that. Uh, the other thing is that if you want, 
well, I'll show you this afterwards. But um, so we want to set it up so that it produces zoom level 17 except within a certain range of airfields, at which case it will produce higher resolution stuff. And that is built on the assumption that when you get close to airfields, you're going to be lower to the ground. That's, that's what they're there for. So what we do is we go into our global config, pop in here, and you see where it says cover airports with high res? Change that from false to true. Cover zoom level, change that to, let's make it 19. And then cover extent. Now I don't know whether this is miles or kilometers, but we'll just set it to four. So if it's miles and 300 feet per mile, this is gonna be essentially 1200 feet or below where it's really gonna matter. Uh, the other thing I do is use decal on terrain, which I don't know the precise reason why, but apparently produces better looking ortho outside of the areas around airports. Now we just hit save and exit. Checking everything else is fine. It is. And now we do this. We do purge OSM data, which is a superstitious move on my part. And then we rebuild it. And you see what it says right there? Downloading the airport water, blah, 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 blah. And you can see there are a few airports around. Melbourne and a few others. All right, and now, I hope this covers the Cape. Uh, if not, we'll go to Melbourne Airport. You can see that, but it's more or less the same. Now, uh, we build the mesh, which is what it's going to drape the pictures over. And we don't need elevation data. It knows where it, to get it. You see, it says viewfinder panorama. Uh, I downloaded it from blah, blah, blah. Okay, and it's done. Now we need to build the masks, and it's going to take a little longer because it's going to look at all the boundaries between water and land, uh, and inland as well because we specified it, and uh, build masks. So we'll just click on that, and you see this progress indicator. It's not, strictly speaking, very accurate. Um, this is not a work of interface art, but it gets the job done. So you see it says constructing binary mask for seawater ground from mesh file for this particular tile and it's a 28 and 081 which is also up here 28 and minus 081 and it is doing its mask fang and that's going to take a minute or two but not too long it usually takes less than a minute and there we go all right 43 seconds now we build the tile and what you'll see down here is it download jpegs from the server you chose which in this case is bing although in brooklyn it's called bada bing and what it'll do is it'll download those jpegs it will convert them to dds's and drape them over this stuff well, there we go. See? It says using a mask, and now it's downloading. And it's converting, and it's downloading, and it's converting, and right there, downloading and converting. So give it a second or two. It's a lot of masks, I notice, and probably that's because there's a lot of mixing between bodies of water uh, and land, uh, which makes sense given where it is. So again, this progress is not, strictly speaking, um, uh, comprehensible. But, you know, you basically go, you have a cup of coffee, you have a cream soda, you do some fucking thing, and uh, when you come back, it's done. In a minute, I'll show you how to do this in batch form. Um, Bear in mind that as it downloads these things, every once in a while it will not download one or two um, photos that it needs. And then X-Plane, when you start up, will say we'll be missing this texture and it'll crash. So um, 
oftentimes you have to build, you have to do the build tile step twice or three times or it won't download everything. And uh, I'm, I'm guessing that Oscar, uh, who wrote uh, Ortho 4XP, is aware of this. The other thing you should be aware of is you're, you're basically taking somebody else's copyrighted photos. So um, don't use this to build scenery. Uh, with for commercial distribution because that's kind of jive um, and um, I, I, by the same token I, I don't think I don't think Google or Microsoft are going to come after you for using this but if you want to be on the ultra safe side um, use one of the uh, government data service servers which I think is associated with the USGS that way, you're not stealing from nobody except Uncle Sam and yourself, if you're American. Um, and, you know, you can decide how you feel about that, but uh, chances are it, it won't be out and out illegal. The other thing to be aware of is if you've got a internet connection that is capped, uh, you're going to be downloading a lot of data. So, just make sure you don't Screw yourself with respect to your internet provider who arbitrarily sticks a cap on you because um, they think you're, uh, I don't know, up to no good. So here we go. We're downloading a metric ton of stuff, as you can see. And each one of these represents a picture. And let's just go into... Um, the folder where it's doing its thing here. So we'll go into uh, tiles and we'll look for 28 and minus 081 and there it is. And as you can see there is terrain and overlay data there. And there's overlay stuff right there. And then here in textures you can see what it's downloading and converting into DDS files and you can see here, uh, as we use the bullshit GIMP, uh, which I really hate, um, this is what it's using to build the scenery. Now, if you don't use overlays, let's just zoom into one-to-one uh, -one here. And instead of using Control-1, apparently it uses a plus. No, of course not. Why would that work? Uh, just trying to use the keystroke equivalent. Uh, zoom. Well, it should work with the plus, but of course it doesn't. We'll go to one to one here, and this is a 17 zoom level 17 here. And um, as you can, uh, you, uh, as you can see, the drag doesn't really work. I'll just scroll that way. And this is what it downloaded and is going to build the scenery out of. Um, let's get out of that, discard the changes, and let's see if we can find a bit of zoom level 19 goodness here. There, here's one. So this must be near an airport. Let's start that sucker up. And now, as you can see, if we go to one to one, much more detail. And um, so that's going to look better when you're lower down. Let's just zoom in on this um, until we're um, half the altitude above it that they are now. So that would be a four time zoom. And uh, you can see zoom four to one, 400 percent. That's not great, but, well, it's also not resampled right, but uh, that said, let's just go to a bit of a zoom level 17 image here. That said, when you go to 4 to 1 on this, look at how much smaller it is. And how much more pixelated it is, so you, you get the idea. And we're almost done here, but 
just see if we actually found the right place. I'm just looking for some Cape landmarks here, see if I can find them. You can see these are the masks that uh, I'm not sure whether they use to build these or whether X-Plane uses these on the fly. I don't know the inner workings. All right, is that is that a launch complex right there? Let's see. It is. Look at that. All right, and that's zoom level 17. I'll just zoom in on that sucker right there. All right, so we're in the right place, I hope. And yeah, that's the VAB. So that's 39A and that's 39B, or the other way around. Look at that. Are we good or what? And here's some uh, further south launch complexes, but where is the where's the landing strip? Let's see if we can find it. Unfortunately, it's all zipping through here pretty quickly. It's Patrick Air Force Base is right around there. There's the causeway. I regret I never got to see a shuttle launch and um, even though I would have been old enough, not by much, but four or five years old, I never got to witness a Saturn V launch, which I, oh, did I always want to. My God, how, how amazing would that be? All right. I mean, I was a child of the space race. Um, I was born in 1964. Um, I woke up early in the morning a few days before Christmas to watch the uh, launch of Apollo 8, which was the first Saturn V launch with people on it. And my parents woke me up late at night in July um, of 1969. I think it was July 21st. Uh, to watch the lunar landing. And uh, I will never forget it. Watched it on a black and white set, which didn't matter because the picture at the time for the uh, Apollo 11 mission, at least, was in black and white. And uh, watched the whole thing. He couldn't obviously watch the landing uh, because there were no cameras on the moon and there were no cameras beaming live pictures out of uh, the LEM, but uh, it was all supplied by an animation, and the, 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 the tension was so high. Uh, of course, watched CBS, watched, watched, uh, watched uh, Walter Cronkite do his thing. Uh, his astronaut sidekick was Wally Schirra, who had retired after his... Um, um, successful but uh, but controversial Apollo 7 wherein um, he caught a cold and um, was burdened he thought with an excessive uh, checklist that was detrimental to the mission and he got a little bit snappish with uh, mission control and basically told them to screw off and um, he uh, came under some fire for that, but uh, that had been uh, very successful for him in his Mercury mission, uh, which came right after Scott Carpenter's, which had been taken up by a lot of scientific experiments and a lot of screwing around and almost killed Carpenter because he ran out of maneuvering fuel and landed three or four hundred miles away from where he should have and was feared lost. So... Um, Let's see if I can uh, show you the uh, Apollo 7. Let's see if Tantrum will get us there. There we go. Near Mutiny on Apollo 7. There we go. Time Magazine. Wally Schirra once told Chris Kraft, he was the head of uh, uh, NASA at the time, to go to hell. Actually, he wasn't the head of NASA. Well, was he? Uh, he was the um, 
uh, chief of the Apollo missions, but uh, uh, nobody up until that moment had ever told Kraft to go to hell, and the fact is Sherrod didn't tell him directly either. He told Deke Slayton, the head of the astronaut corps, uh, to tell Kraft to go to hell. Um, let's see. There we go. Yeah, you see, this this followed the uh, Apollo One fire, and so this was this was a bumpy ride back into space, and the pressure was very very high. Um, but oh yeah, here we go. Uh, after all this, it was no surprise that when the space spacecraft finally. Uh, uh, took off for its 11-day trip, Shara would be just as much of a pit bull about how the ship would be flown. Uh, NASA scientists had stuffed the flight plan with experiments and astronomical observations, but Shara didn't want any part of them. This was an engineering mission as he, as the test pilots like to call it, meaning it was a shakedown flight for the ship itself, not a working trip for the men in lab coats. And bear in mind that this was an approach that served him very, very well for his Mercury mission. Uh, and um, you can understand uh, why someone who had lost three of his comrades, including uh, one of his good friends, uh, 21 months before, and had overseen the re-engineering of the spacecraft that he was on, uh, might uh, want to make sure that the spacecraft itself uh, was in good working order before uh, messing around with experiments. And uh, then they all got colds, and their ears were filling up, and, um, and all the rest of it. And um, he... Uh, <laughs> Well, what happened was, according to uh, Chris Kraft and Deke Slayton, uh, according to Slayton, I told him the whole world was following this flight and he and his crew were not coming across well. I told him he was trained to do a job and that he'd better get busy doing it. And Kraft asked, and Slayton replied, and he told me to go to hell. So, you know, this is, um, this is what happens in human endeavors, human beings are involved, and I think it's fascinating because the image that uh, most Americans had gotten uh, of the astronauts at that time, at least before Tom Wolfe years later wrote the right stuff, was that, uh, that they were somehow superhuman instead of simply human. And um, Wally Shira was as good a test pilot as any and as good an engineer as any. Uh, and people, instead of seeing that side of him at that moment, saw the human side of him, which in a way is a good thing. All right, so here's a, here's a picture of an airport there at zoom level 18 here that's going into our scenery. And we'll look at it one to one, and boy, that looks pretty damn good, doesn't it? Look at that. And you can tell that, look at that. That's a decathlon... Uh, high wing. Look at look at the uh, paint job on there. That's a decathlon tail dragger right there. Look at that. That's pretty damn good. I I can only tell that because I I can see the wing, the shape of the wing, but also the paint job, which has got um, diagonal stripes here. Uh, my buddy lasts briefly until his wife threw a Wally Shira. Um, about riding in the back of it had a decathlon, which is an aerobatic, uh, beautiful airplane with, you know, stick instead of a yoke and obviously no place to store things. Let's see if we can look at it. I'll show you what the paint job looks like. We can find it. All right, here we go. Look at that. There. You see the, uh, right there? Dot, 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 dot. And you can see at the same time right here. Ah, I'm on the wrong side of it. No, wait, there it is. It's right down there. Hang on, let's see. 
God, what a pain in the ass this program is. Much as I dislike Adobe, Photoshop is a dream compared to this crap. Yeah, look. See? Cheat, 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 cheat. There, right there. And that's the shape of the wing. Look at that. And the shape of the tail plane perfectly. This was a fun plane. Uh, when I wrote in it, I sat in the back here and, and Les made a whole string of uh, beautiful, beautiful, perfect three-point landings, um, which I attribute, of course, to the rear word COG from uh, being in the back of it. But as you can see, um, it's just a little cramped. It's not the sort of plane you want to fly to Grandma's house. But, oh, what a, what a fun airplane. There it is. That's, that's the best, best look of it down there. And there that is. Very distinctive airplane. So much fun. It's like, it's like driving a Mazda Miata or something. Or like I saw originally today, a, a Datsun 240Z. Here, let me show you what I saw today. Like just an elemental sports car. There, there, look at that. Oh, it's got mini light wheels on it too. Let's see if there's a shot of the interior. There, ah, look at that. Look at that. Four speed stick, inline six cylinder engine. Basically beat the British at what the British were doing. It was the precursor to the Miata, but better. Ah, oh, what a car that was. Light, direct, non-power steering, you know, manual steering. Matter of fact, the one I saw was a 72. Uh, these are all aftermarket wheels, but look at that. The car was designed by um, BMW's uh, former designer, a guy named Albrecht Gortz. Let's see if I can... Who designed BMWs, oddly enough. Let's see if I can find it. Albrecht von Goetz uh, and 240Z. Ah, there he is. There's the guy. And there's, there's the BMW he built. And you can see. And there is his baby for Datsun. Magnificent. Did he also design did he also design the two, Toyota 2000? Uh, let's see. Probably not. Ah, oh, so perfect for Germany. A German aristocrat father and a Jewish mother. Good for him. Good for them. Let's see. Did he also design this beauty, which is the Toyota uh, 2000 GT, which was, of course, seen in um, You Only Live Twice. Unclear, but he lived to be 92. Bravo. The 70s and 80s had great cars. Look at this. It's a Porsche 928 right there. That was the first front engine um, liquid-cooled V8 Porsche. Look at this thing. I built a model of this from uh, Tamiya Models, which was like the greatest model car company in the world. Let's see if we can find it. I mean, it was, it was, the thing practically ran, it was so complete. God, the internet is great. There. God, look at that. That is a model. I didn't do such a good job on it. But I mean, it, it even had rubber tires and the interior. Look at that. 
Oh yeah, I remember those stars. One one twentieth scale. <laughs> My God. The other thing I uh, built, maybe you did too. Let's see if we can get the Tamiya Tyrrell Formula One car. Here we go, the T Tyrrell P34. And uh, this is another reason why the uh, 70s and 80s were great. Look at this race car. You know how boring Formula One cars are now? Look at that. It had six wheels for lower lower drag here. Look at that. That's just, that's just freaking awesome. And, and there it is in model form. I mean, look at, look at how beautiful that model is. So Jody uh, Schechter there. I believe Ronnie Peterson also drove it. Ah, oh, what a thing of beauty. And that's a model. I mean, that looks like a photograph. That's, that's this unbelievably cool that is first national city bank of new york which is now known as citibank and there we, okay so we're done building our tile now all we have to do is build our overlay all right that's going to take about 3.71 seconds now i've already got my overlay uh um sim linked into my uh, sim so all that remains for us to do is to find our tile which happens to be this one right here and I'm going to um, sim link it into my um, folder my custom scenery folder you could just drag it in but then you might run out of space so I've got a little utility um, like called sim link creator or something like that that add some functionality to the uh, Windows Explorer. So you just right click on it, pick link source, and that's this. Go into custom scenery, uh, drop as symbolic link, and we're done. Now the folder is in there, and now we just have to make sure it appears in the right order in the scenery stack. So we start up um, X plane 11, or in fairness, X plane 10 will do the same thing. And instead of waiting for it to go through all of it, we just quit X plane immediately as soon as we see this. What it's done is it's read our scenery um, folder and it's um, uh, dropped an entry into our scenery INI. Uh, file which governs where the scenery appears, uh, how, what, how the layers appear. So what we do is we go down to our scenery.ini file, which is in our custom scenery thing, open it up with a text editor, and you see there is our tile, but you also see it's on top of a whole bunch of stuff. Now it doesn't really hurt, but if we had airports from this area there, it would cover them up. So we don't want that to happen. So we delete that. And we go down almost to the bottom or all the way to the bottom. If, if you've got mesh scenery, the mesh goes below it. You just have to make sure that the overlay folder is right there, is above the ortho tile. So we just drop that sucker in right there. And we start up X-Plane again after saving this. And now, we start it up, it's going to take a minute or two to kind of churn through its, uh, its stuff. And we'll just choose new flight, same location. Ignore that. I may get a scenery error or two because of some, some bad airport I've got dropped in there, but might not. I think I deleted it. But let's see. So it's going to take a minute to read new scenery files, and believe me, it, this stuff gobbles up disk space, and it gobbles up VRAM, too. So you really want to be careful about the zoom level you use. Uh, or you'll find uh, yourself in single digits for the frame rates, and you'll look at the VRAM used, and you'll discover that it's using 16 gigs of VRAM or something insane. So obviously we don't want that. And we 
just wait for it to load here. I'm, I'm, as we're doing this, I'm looking at my hard drive uh, flashing. Uh, I've got about four terabytes of this already, maybe, maybe even more. Uh, if you want to cover the entire United States, say, um, you better plan on having multiple eight or ten terabyte drives. Um, people like John Fly, I think, uh, have a bunch of it. But okay, so here we go. Orlando Executive Information Zulu, seventeen hundred Zulu weather. Let's skip that. And uh, let me just, before we do anything else, let me just get restarted here so that uh, we're not uh, running cold here and we can actually go flying. And I need to reconnect my yoke, which is sadly become disconnected. And it looks, ah, there it is. All right, there we go. It's connecting up. But a second to collect itself. Initialize it right here. And it's connected, and we'll connect it to the sim. And there we go. Pop up our uh, flaps. And uh, just prime the engine here. In the real world, when it's warm, you don't really have to prime the engine or at least not prime it very much. In this sim, if you don't prime it for a few seconds, it just barfs. It's trying to be realistic, but it's being a little too realistic. So let's turn off our avionics, crack our throttle, crank our engine. There we go. Very nice. OK, on with the avionics. On with our lights, on with our life, and let's just take a look here now. Now what you see right here is uh, from the airport designer. As we get above it though, well first of all already the first change you notice is it's got water here courtesy of the photo and it is so small a body of water that we just have the picture, we don't have any masking in between the two. But what we do have right here in this bigger body of inland water there is um, a blend of the photo and the X-plane water right here. And it's blended very smoothly and you get a coastline and you see the pictures of all this. The effect is a little subtle right here, but you notice that there is um, there are cars around there. And now, if you look here, you see a more detailed picture of the Cape. Let's just quickly go up here, and we'll just point out here. And you see that instead of looking like X-Plane sort of lime green um, grass, you see um, the real world, and you also see buildings over lying it. So uh, let me just see what the runway looks like because sometimes if the runway in the airport isn't aligned with the picture you'll get a ghost image of the picture underneath the runway but here it seems to be pretty nicely lined up and so let's just quickly uh, quickly go go flying here and I'll just take you for a little tour of it and then maybe we'll go someplace where the scenery is really spectacular so you can get a better look at it. So. Get up in the sky here. Try not to embarrass ourselves on, on this 300 foot wide landing strip. Let's see if I can get in the air before the numbers even. All right. Do a little short field takeoff there. All right, gear up. Let's turn around to the north, because I think most of the tile I built was to the north of here. Now do a sensible climb power. Up there, right about there. Got no flaps. So 
can see there's x plane water here, but it's also blended a little bit with the photo scenery. And you can see down below there is the photo of the place. You can see there's negligible impact on the frame rates uh, because we've sensibly kept um, our zoom levels um, only high around um, airports. So let's just get on out of here get away from this sort of airport scenery maker um, created scenery. Come around to the north. And in a second you'll see when these trees change color a little bit, you'll see that's where the boundary is more or less. And again, I'm just sort of illustrating the benefit um, even um, even when um, we're over relatively flat terrain. So there's the edge of our airport. You can see it gives way to the uh, photo scenery, or better photo scenery, or slightly different color photo scenery. And we'll head across the Banana River. Just head to the northwest here. Unfortunately, I've got a little bit of a repeating pattern here in my x plane water. I don't know why that is. Um, that's as of x plane 11. I just level off here. And we'll be on across the inland waterway here. I'll show you the benefits of this, even when you're reasonably down low in here. So I'll just come down to cruise power. I believe that's Melbourne Airport there, so just light off in that direction. And with any luck, we'll be able to see the difference between um, the zoom level 17 and the zoom level um, 19, closer to aerodromes, as we call them. And the low and power here, we'll just fix that. Throw some more beans on the fire. That Patrick Air Force Base. And no, uh, it's not there. And uh, right now I'm set up for um, uh, two times super sampled anti aliasing. Again, I'm at about 30, uh, I'm at 1440p wide screen. That will help to go off here at 2,000 feet. Trim out a little bit. So now you can see there is photographic stuff, but there is also X-plane overlays and things. And that's a little bit of realism. No, I think this is Patrick right there. And you can see the border uh, between the um, photo water and the X-plane water. It, it's, it's accentuated here because the water is such a foul color compared to the default because it's a little bit of swampy shit. This is, but let's um, let's make for it, and then we'll um, we'll set down um, someplace. Um, we'll set down someplace a little more congenial to um, ortho photo scenery. Just get myself into a little bit of a uh, left downwind here for this runway off a wing. doing more of what I should be doing all along, which is flying by eye, not flying by gauges. I'm grossly misconfigured here, I'm just getting the landing configuration, and I'm high. And here, I come all down.
to the old proverbial nacho out. I believe those are two unused by the way, but I could be wrong. Get ourselves established on the base. We'll be good. New trim. And there you can see ortho scenery with um, Autogen over top of it. It's pretty damn good. And there we go. I want to get us established here. There's the higher res ortho you can see right there. Also see we're high, but it's a nice long runway. Fine. A little bit of wind from our right. Died right there. And there's the ground effect. How do you like that? Two landings for the price of one. All right, so let's go someplace where the ortho is spectacular. Just come to a stop here. Throw on the brakes. Turn off the avionics. Power down. Turn off our batteries. All right, so where are we going to go? That's really good. Well, let's see what's on our ortho map here. Just to open this up again, just as a memory aid, so I remember where I've made tiles. Go to our tile map. And what's strikingly spectacular? Let's see, this is desert. You know where we'll go? Let's go to Portland, because we've got uh, Mount... Uh, We've got Mount Hood and Mount St. Helens right around there. So let's go there. And we've got a good airport, too. So we'll go to uh, Mr. X's KPDX. you also see how this thing behaves in a little bit, um, little bit more uh, challenging uh, graphic environment. So KPDX. Is there an airport right near Mount Hood? Let's find out. Lake Hood. This is sort of a half-assed way to do it, but... Go to our... There's Mount Hood, and there is the Columbia River uh, Gorge. Let's see if there's something on Sky Vector. If not, we'll just just get close. Okay, there's KPDX, S48, let's just go to our, our Aurora 
state. Where is the mountain? There is Mount Hood. And what is around there? Pine Hollow. And there's no designator for it. That's a no good. Let's see, Hanel. Country Squire. Let's see if S48 is there, because then we'll just fly due east from there. Ha! Country Square Airport, Air Park. Good show. All right, so go there and we'll uh, see what we see. I know, I know, I know. I could cut the video at this point, but. Um, I, uh, at the moment, uh, am not sitting where I normally edit videos, so. Um, give it one second here. bit uh, out of uh, sorts here. Um, taking some medicine for the next three days and I can't have anything to drink and it's making me cranky. I know that's probably a sure sign of alcoholism, so, or it could just be a sure sign of crankiness. I'm not sure. Um, not normally cranky. Um, not normally cranky about fake flying. So it's reading new scenery files and it's taking a long time because like uh, you'll discover, these things take up a lot of hard disk space. I, I, I haven't yet bit, bitten the bullet and um, um, bought, you know, a, a, a two or a four terabyte SSD and tried to slap them on there. Um, that that would be the the, the true mark of uh, of utter insanity. Uh, eventually, I probably will. But so far, other than this loading right now, um, I haven't seen a huge um, performance penalty in just active flying around. So we'll see. All right, here we go. Oh, look at that. It's an actual strip strip, not a grass strip. And there's our ortho scenery underneath it. Let's just see what it looks like. And there is Mount Hood. And if you notice down there, and this is where ortho scenery is not that great, is there is the ortho trees, and there are the trees kind of scattered willy-nilly autogen. And... Um, also, oh, and this is interesting too, yeah, this is a problem when X-Plane just lays a default airport over the ortho. You notice the ortho runway is pointing this way and the X-Plane runway is pointing this way. When you have um, handmade airports, um, generally they're made with ortho in mind and they generally line up with the pictures. This is the sort of stuff that in um, Orbix scenery um, first of all, they, they, they buy their ortho photo and they buy the rights to it. And the other thing is they are very careful about um, color correcting and laying airports in the correct, correct position and lining up the scenery. It is not the case here. Um, there's a guy, the guy who does um, World to X-Plane Autogen, who has come up with some sort of utility that actually looks for things that look like trees and photographs and then lays the um, autogen correctly over them instead of sort of semi-correctly based on uh, open street map and that sort of data. Um, so eventually that's going to get better. But let, let's just fly towards Mount Hood and then 
we'll come back and land in Portland, which is just a beautiful airport here. So let's just uh, get ready to go here. And again, uh, even though it's really not called for because the engine is very warm, uh, for some reason we have to prime. So we'll prime. Two, three, four, boom. And in the Bonanza, you start with uh, Mixture Full Rich. In the Arrow, I fly in real life. Um, you um, start with the mixture about half full. Uh, it all depends on, on, on the engine. Uh, I'll just connect the yoke here. I've screwed that up before, and I've uh, uh, rolled down the runway. And if you're trimmed OK, you sort of fly all right for a second until you um, uh, try to uh, maneuver. And then bad things happen. All right, we'll set our trim about there, and we'll just get started. Oh, thing of beauty. All right. Turn all the rest of this crap on. And actually, before we depart here, let's just get rid of this here. these things. All right, red S48, we'll just set up for PDX here, just so we've got, no, just so we've got um, a uh, magenta line, but we're, we're going to be navigating by the river, so it shouldn't be a big deal, but uh, let's do this. Okay. Now yeah, let's go to Finland. Anywhere in Finland's good this time of year. It's it's too warm here in the summer. That's Denmark. All right. The X. All right. And we'll just make that leg active. So there, now we've got, if we want it, magenta line. That's 35 miles, so no big deal. All right, so we'll fly out to, to Mount, uh, Mount Hood, do a little reconnaissance, and then um, head back to Portland. You can sort of see the whole array of scenery here. So let's do a short field departure. We will uh, run up the power. We will pull back as soon as possible and then we'll coast in the ground effect. You can see we're getting about 48 frames here. Start out with the stick full back. Oh, I don't know if we need it really full back. effect here until we build some speed and go gear up and head into the mountains. plane as well because although it does not feel exactly like a real plane, it feels enough like a real plane that it becomes useful. Um, and if you do a lot of simulated flying and you can spend the 10 grand it takes on average to get your private ticket, um, yeah, you're going to be spending an extra 1700 bucks for a yoke. But at least you won't be um, actively sabotaging your own training um, whenever you sit down at the sim. Uh, some might disagree, but okay, so there, there is the 
points of scenery, which as we get higher up will begin uh, to coalesce and really um, um, look a lot better. Uh, we're above 1,000 AGL. I'm just going to come back to a, a sensible 25 by 25 here. And you notice if you bring the prop back and it takes bigger bites of the air, the manifold pressure is going to creep up a little bit, or it should. And it's not. I might have my uh, aircraft engineering a little bit off, and we can lean a little bit too because we're already at 3,000 feet. a little bit. Just looking at this right here. And uh, they say when you're flying VFR, you should get your head out of the cockpit. You should obviously look around and you should choose a landmark that you want to fly towards. And oddly enough, we have one. So now, as you can see, as we're getting a little higher up, it's starting to take on more of the characteristic of the uh, the ortho photo. It's not perfect, and if, if I were really doing this, I'd probably run fewer trees, but you can't separately adjust the trees, and if you run fewer trees, you get fewer roads, and I don't want fewer roads. Um, so again, I'm now flying based on the pressure on the yoke to maintain my rate of climb, and based on the picture out the window. So if my picture goes like this, it means that I'm turning like this, I'm turning the other direction. And if my picture, as well as the feel on the yoke, if the pushback on my yoke increases, uh, I've nosed myself down. And if the force to maintain this increases, it means I've pulled myself up. So, the aim here is to fly without looking at these things very much. Just to glance back and just cross check. So we're going to try and maintain yeah, just about the speed. And relatively low in flight. And we're just, since we made the turn, keep ourselves back, heading towards the mountain. Ah, that looks like a can of bush beer. go. Uh, the mountain is uh, 12 and a half thousand feet high. We are not going to uh, climb above it and circle around it. We'll just continue up the way we're going. And we'll increase power a little bit as we climb because the air gets thinner and therefore the manifold pressure decreases but I'm already maxed out. This is where a, a, a turbocharged engine would come in handy, or even a turbo-normalized engine, which um, uh, doesn't overboost, but it simply compensates for altitude. In other words, that's where the turbo-normalized comes in. It simply behaves like a normally aspirated engine, but higher and higher and higher. The other thing is we get higher up, our stall speed obviously climbs, so it gets thinner, so let's just see where we stall at this altitude. Just kind of precipitate a little stick shaper action here. And with this yoke, I can just ease the nose up and do it almost arbitrarily. I'm not going to trim into this because I want to be trimmed back for the right speed, so. The controls are getting mushy as hell, and my uh, setup reflects that. Alright, just ride that up a little bit and just mush those down. And I'm not doing this by the attitude indicator, I'm doing it by the tip of the mountain, so I'm going to put my nose right on the tip of the mountain, and if I hold it there long enough, I will stall. Right about there. Yeah, a little higher, maybe. Yeah, right about there. No, actually, that's good. Let's see how much higher I can get. There we go. Right about there. 
and you notice that boom, you can write down. Um, so you can do that with respect to the horizon and know when you're flying level. It's harder in mountain flying because obviously um, there is no even horizon, but um, other people who know how to fly in mountains uh, better than certainly I uh, probably um, have ways to deal with that. Also, on the way up to uh, Mount Hood is the hotel that they use uh, in... Um, God, what am I blanking on it? Uh, the Stanley uh, Kubrick uh, uh, movie. Oh, great. I can't believe I just uh, forgot it with Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall and Scott Van Crothers and The Shining, of course. Alright, so now, as you can see, that is a photograph of the mountain, basically draped over um, mesh. And you can get the best kind of look at ortho scenery um, when uh, stuff is above the tree line because that is, I mean, that for all the world, is Mount Hood. Uh, and it is gorgeous. All right, so let's, uh, let's come on back to uh, on back to uh, Portland, and uh, we'll just, let's see, I have to come out this way, the better view of the mountain, and we'll level off at 8,000 feet, because we are not uh, carrying oxygen. We'll be turn there. We'll try to intercept our course using the HSI, or if you happen to be English, the HSI, which I kind of love. At least you know it's you know that's an H when you say H. You you, you know what a H does. It it goes. <sighs> All right, so on we go. Let's just be trim here because I'm totally trimmed for climb and for much lower speed. We shove the nose down, and I know that the level of flight is about there, but we can speed up, so I'll be the nose lower. So I put that around the horizon. And you notice it corresponds to uh, nose down flying, I mean uh, level flying. Turn down a bit more, and we will bring uh, power to. 23 and our crops to 23. That'll speed us up a bit. And as uh, as my instructor told me, you should be able to fly a plane with two fingers in one hand if you trim it right. And the way we're going to intercept this uh, course here is we're going to keep the tip of the um, CDI on the love line, the line that comes right down there, um, corresponds to our direction of flight, and as we get closer to it, we're going to turn in with it, so as this moves to here, we're going to turn to follow it. Um, in reality, what you would probably do is you wait until it gets to about there and then just turn all the way in on it, but I'll just show you how to nibble way in on on a course. First let me just get ourselves doubled out a little bit here. Pump up the power a bit. And trim down a bit. And you can see that this course here corresponds to the basically to the angle offset. Um, of um, our uh, HSI, and that's why it's so useful. All right, so there's the needle starting to move as we get closer to course, 
and I confess I don't know uh, how many miles deviation each one of these represents. It's probably degrees because um, it's going to change with distance to a station or a point, I'm guessing, but uh, I'm not sure. In the meantime, let me just get our heading bug squared up so that uh, the... Uh, and look at that down there. I mean, that basically looks like you're flying over a photograph if it up to some of the random trees in the wrong places, but that, that'll be fixed soon enough. Creeping up in altitude, too. Fix that a little bit. Just come down slightly. And we're just waiting for the needle to come in, and after which we should be about... Oh, uh, 30 miles away from uh, Portland. Let's come down a little bit more here. And I can tell by the way the wind, by the way we're drifting a little bit, that we do have a little bit of wind. And it's blowing us a little bit from uh, right to left. We're waiting for the CDI to come in, and it will come in as soon as we get closer to there. And look down there. See, there's there's the autogen, and there's the photo scenery. And look at how the trees perfectly match right there with the uh, uh, ortho photo. So in some places, it's it's very well matched, and others a little less so. And what I should be doing is it should be looking at right here. Sod and not. So that's the Columbia River. Actually, what we could do is we just make for the river, but let me show you how to intercept the course first. The first thing is to make an altitude. Okay. So let's see, there's our pseudo horizon, it's a little bit lumpy. And at this speed, at this altitude, we're about Four, four degrees, five degrees nose down. So instead of being right about there, it's right about there is where level of flight is. And in a real plane, an instructor will take a post-it note and will s smack it over this or over this or over this or all of them and say, okay, fly the plane. And if you know your pitch and your power settings, and I do, um, and I know what they're reference to here, and I do, then for the most part you can get by, and even get by an in instrument. Well, let's, let's just experiment with that, see how we do it as soon as we get on this course. And at some point I'll just go to the river here. could do is we could just cheat a little bit, so we'll just turn into it. There we go. Now it'll come in much faster, obviously. And we'll see what I Alright, so in it comes, and then we turn so that we keep this Hit, but we're already practically through the course. Okay, that should be, actually, that'll fit us nicely. And boom. Now, once we get established on it, then the trick is to find out what the wind is and find out whether you have to crank in a few degrees to the right or the left to keep that needle centered. Really, what I want to do is I want to show you a little visual flying. So we're at 8,000 feet. Let's see how we do. Let's come over and fly it from over here. And actually, let me get this out of our line of sight. 
This is going to be a little bit of cheating because there we go. Because it can't really line up the horizon the way I'd like to. Just do it this way. So we'll fly around for here for a while. Turn towards the river. Pull a little bit, not that much, so that the nose stays about the same with respect to the horizon. Level out. Fly towards the river here. Another minute or two. I'm climbing a little bit. I'm certainly out of trim. Badly, we misjudged it. Alright, so there's the river. And yes, we've been climbing the whole time. We're at 8,500 feet. And that is the airport. So let's descend. Come down to 15 inches of manifold. And although we wouldn't ordinarily do it this soon, we bring the props forward, give us a little more drag. Are we going to try and make the runway from here? Shall we? Alright. To go down, we have to slow down first. Establish a little slip. Left rudder with right aileron. And we'll get some flaps out. Just make sure our speed doesn't go above 120. There we go. Alright, so we're hard in the slip here. We're at idle power. And we've got to come down. Thousand feet per mile, so it's a triple rate descent right there. We can do this. Get the nose down. We're going to even go for the nearer runway, the right hand side there. And we are going down about triple standard rate, 3,300 feet per minute. cheating because I'm doing a little S turn to increase our distance, but it's not. And look at that scenery. So this is all ortho photo right here instead of like made up X plane stuff. There's our eyeballs. There's our runway. Okay, this isn't even gonna be close. We will have some speed to bleed off, though. Gear down, flaps down. Why heavens to murder, Troy? We're showing four whites. Don't even know where the wind is coming from, so this is probably not best practices, but... Who said anything about being good? Okay, we'll ease out of the slip. And you notice there's the photo scenery right there, and it abuts perfectly the uh, shoreline. That's our masks at work. Still four whites, obviously. Retrim for the lower speed, because I'm pulling back like a son of a bitch. There we go. Rest for success. We're doing about 29, 30 frames right now. Coming up on a, on a schmancy airport. There we go. We're on profile. Okay. Let's come 
up to our correct um, landing speed and power. Right about there. There. Perfect. And we'll just lolly get it on in. Luckily, it's in the standard prevailing wind direction here at Portland, which is uh, coming from the west. has a little bit of an exaggerated weather vaning tendency. It points into the wind probably more than it ought to. off a strut. There we are. Uh, welcome to Portland, where the local frame rate is about 26, which is not too damn bad, all things considered. And uh, that's how you make uh, orthophoto scenery and fly around in it. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Broken a few laws here and there. But we'll just uh, pull in right here and uh, stuff the airplane into one of those uh, one of those baggage containers and uh, pick it up uh, pick it up at the claim. When I was little, I read the sign and I thought it was the baggage clam. And I pictured a giant mollusk opening up and providing your bags. That would be pretty cool. All right, let's just pretend we're done flying here. Parking brake set. Avionics off. Off, landing lights off, strobe off, beacon off. Flaps up so we don't look like a moron. Hello, Portland. And um, let me know what you think. I didn't show you how to make batch uh, scenery, but the way, well, shit. The way you do it, sorry about that. That's the one thing I forgot to do. Um, is even cooler. What you do is you go to your map. And... Um, You wait for it to stop freezing. Ah, there we go. All right, you go to your tile map here. And what you do is instead of double clicking, you shift click and shift click and shift click and shift click and shift click. I'm just going to do the whole coastline here. Because why the hell not? Because what else am I going to do on a weekend? All right, so get a whole mess of these suckers right there. And you make sure everything is hunky-dory the way you want it. You choose build masks, build overlays. And make sure your config file is confabulated the way you want it. And let's see, zoom level 17, 
custom overlay directory there and I'm just going to do this true and 19 I know there's a way to do this so it sticks permanently by tweaking the actual config file but I've been unable to make that work for some reason so there we go there we are save and exit and now from your tile uh, map you choose build masks build overlays leave these two blank and you choose batch build and you're off to the races and you can see right there away it goes anyway now that concludes our um, little uh, video for today I hope you liked it thank you for watching it's good to be back on the YouTubes and uh, I'll see you again real real soon bye bye